Welcome to today's webinar on attic protection using special sprinklers. My name is Brandon Telford, Technical Services Manager with Reliable Automatic Sprinkler Company, and I will be your presenter today. The Technical Services Department is available via phone or email Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. NFPA 13, 1999 edition offered criteria for protecting attics using standard three sprinklers that is quite different than what we find in editions currently published today. At that time, we were able to use sprinklers with coverage areas up to 130 square feet. And we could also space those sprinklers three feet down from the peak. Our calculations would allow for a 7 PSI ended pressure and installation at the eaves could be quite close. In this example on the screen, we've placed them at three feet away from the eave. Should a fire occur at the eave, this type of layout would allow for the fire to run in between the rows of sprinklers, accumulate smoke and heat at the peak, and operate sprinklers sporadically as that smoke traveled down the ridge line. This resulted in often large amounts of damage, both from fire, smoke, and water in the attic space. As an industry, we became aware that the NFPA 13 attic sprinkling criteria was not really that effective, and a full scale fire test program was run at UL. Six tests in total were run and then the information provided to an NFPA task group, which allowed for NFPA to create some new installation criteria that was first published in the NFPA 13 2002 edition. Since 2002, we have not really seen big changes to the way we protect attic. It's remained virtually unchanged. The major changes that occurred were smaller areas of coverage per sprinkler head. We also wanted to have the maximum spacing between sprinklers be limited. We mandated sprinklers be installed at the peaks. Sprinklers installed along the eave must maintain a minimum distance. And then we would get potentially higher operating pressures depending upon how we decide to space our sprinklers perpendicular to the slope. Our coverage area table located in NFPA 13 has a new section that was added specifically for attics. These combustible concealed spaces in accordance with 86414 now indicate that the maximum spacing for this type of area is 120. That used to remain at 130 and now you can see a reduction of 10 square foot of coverage. The 120 square foot of coverage area allowed by this table in NFPA 13 does not permit the use of spacing how you would like to in the attic. There's going to be a requirement of 15 foot parallel to the slope and 10 foot perpendicular slope as maximum measurements allowed per sprinkler head. We now install sprinklers at the peak instead of up to three foot down from the peak. This is important because it ensures that we basically are gonna have a sprinkler up there. And when that smoke and heat accumulates, uh, we are now going to be able to have that sprinkler head activate. And depending upon where the fire is at, we might not be able to discharge water on it, especially if it's down at the eave. But having that sprinkler head activate is going to start introducing water into the peak area of the, the roof. And that's ultimately where that, that smoke and heat is collecting. We're gonna get the water uh, converting over to steam, cooling the attic. Uh, there's a lot of beneficial stuff that's happening by having that sprinkler head start to discharge, even though we're not able to discharge water onto the area where the fire is at potentially. We do have a requirement to install sprinklers now a minimum distance from the eave. That number is five feet away. Now the biggest concern and a lot of stuff that was uh, documented about fires is that the fires occur sometimes outside of the building. If the building had a balcony and, and uh, something was cooking up there, the fire could 
come up the outside of the building and enter at the eave. And if those sprinkler reds were really tucked down far into the eave, uh, that fire could poke up in there and run right past them. And, and because they're down low and the smoke and heat goes up the slope, we're not going to have activation of those sprinkler reds. So our idea is that we're going to pull them back now a five foot minimum. Uh, so that way if that fire pokes in there, there's a chance that the fire could actually start one of those sprinkler reds. Common question with protection of attics has been where do we start to space our sprinkler heads and it was one of those things that NFPA 13 was fairly gray on for some time but with the 2016 edition we saw a nice figure added to the annex that dictates where we would do that measurement from so in this instance right here we actually get a measurement point of the intersection of the bottom cord and the top cord Right, and that, that saves a significant amount of coverage there that you don't need to use on your sprinkler heads. Uh, if there's insulation, it gets even better because now we're looking at the intersection of insulation and that top cord. So this is like, again, a nice figure that was added to the annex of NFPA 13 uh, with the 2016 edition. It, it clarifies some things for standard spray sprinklers. It's also worth mentioning that when it comes to special sprinklers for use in attic protection, we follow the same exact guidelines for starting the measurement of these types of sprinkler heads coverage area. So just something to keep in mind. Another nice figure that was added to NFPA 13 2016 edition in the annex is the one that we have right here. And this details acceptable ways to lay out sprinkler heads underneath the hip portion of a roof. And you'll see here that we have actually two ways to go about doing this. On this side of the attic, we can basically straddle that hip line with sprinklers on both sides. And we'll keep a five foot maximum away from the hip line and a five foot minimum away from the eave line. That's acceptable method number one. And then number two is we have the ability to install the sprinkler head directly underneath of the hip line. And we're gonna make sure that we're a seven foot maximum away from our intersection of our insulation and uh, where we're going to do our measuring point from. Some people are going to take a look at those figures and try and map out coverage area of these sprinkler heads and you're going to maybe question some of these uh, coverage areas because if we take a look at this side particularly over here we're going to end up with what is perceived as a large area that is considered uncovered by sprinkler heads. One thing that we need to be really aware of though is that this hip portion of the attic, everything is sloping down towards that corner right here. And basically you're just, you're running out of room. So uh, ultimately this may look like it's uncovered area, but there's really not all that much room down there to begin with. And any kind of fire that originates in this area is ultimately going to push up towards this direction. So we're going to be able to catch it with this sprinkler, catch it with this sprinkler, or if it gets past there, catch it with sprinklers behind it. It's not going to really go anywhere. It's going to be forced to head up this hip line. So it's really not that bad of an uncovered area. And that's why it's considered acceptable according to NFPA 13 Annex in 2016 and beyond. Now let's revisit this table here where we talked about the uh, way that the coverage area is provided 15 foot parallel to slope and 10 foot perpendicular to slope. Well, we know that that's actually 150 square foot and that means that that's greater than 120. So we can't do both those numbers. We have to choose. Uh, there's also an asterisk located right here with the slope. And that asterisk refers us over to this section right here. Now what that's going to indicate is that if we install those sprinkler heads, with a dimension perpendicular slope that's going to exceed eight foot, we're now going to have to calculate up to 20 PSI as a minimum for that sprinkler as opposed to seven. So this is a big penalty that you really don't want to probably take on on your design. Uh, it's just going to cause a significant amount more water than you need in that attic space. Now, if we take a look at a current attic design using one of our NFPA standards that has been significantly changed. You see our sprinkler head coverage area is now 120 square foot. 
our sprinkler spacing has now been reduced to 12 by 8 and, and basically that a foot right here perpendicular uh, that's to ensure that we end up having that 7 psi ended pressure as a minimum we're also installing sprinklers at the peak and this is a big change right here because now we actually have five branch lines in this attic as opposed to four which ultimately adds more cost of material and then ultimately labor and we're also maintaining that five foot away from the eave this time as well same situation we have a fire occur down at the eave if it does manage to get in between those two sprinklers once it gets to the peak we have activation of our sprinklers at the ridge line and again we're getting that effect of cooling we're turning that water into steam the fire is going to continue to grow down below but ultimately we're going to hopefully activate the sprinklers that are closer to the fire and then eventually offer that control and contain measurement that nfpa 13 uh, is really providing if we continue to use standard spray sprinkler heads in an attic space there's some things that we need to understand that are a bit of a drawback first and foremost if we do end up exceeding that eight foot measurement uh, we are forced into that 20 psi end head pressure resulting in a 25 gallon a minute demand per sprinkler on a 5.6 k factor um, if we divide that by the 120 square foot of coverage area that's allowed we're going to result with a 0.21 density um, that's twice of what's required in that attic space per nfpa 13's light hazard design density we also when we're dealing with dry systems having to look at increasing the remote area by 30 percent and then also we have to do a 30 percent in the design area increase just because it's underneath of a slope that ultimately turns out to be a 2535 square foot design area also anytime that we protect an attic space and we're utilizing standard spray sprinkler heads the opportunity to use cpvc piping is off the table for the sprinklers in the attic and then also to supply sprinklers in the floor below so ultimately probably not where we want to be with that type of sprinkler head now often we look at nfpa 13r as a project comes across our desk and we say oh there's no requirement to do attics it's pretty clear it says sprinklers shall not be required in attics so simple clear uh, cut but what we need to be aware of is that there's been multiple fires in attics that were protected according to the nfpa 13r standard um, i believe the number sits around 37 right now we have not had a loss of life in those types of structures but there was a large loss of property so nfpa 13 hosted a summit on 13r specifically in december of 2015 and incorporated many stakeholders building owners fire code officials manufacturers insurance agencies etc so to really discuss hey we have these fires that are occurring we have a large loss no life so is nfp 13r doing what it needs to be doing and ultimately everybody said yeah nfp 13r is a life safety standard uh, so we feel like it's delivering the level of coverage that we need and we're not going to make any drastic changes to it the IBC building code personnel as well they looked at it and they said yeah we can probably classify these sprinklers as being a, a stretch of, of extending the building code beyond what we really intend so we need to take and, and scale it back a little bit and what they did was they, they changed the requirement for pedestal podium style construction so in 2018 edition of IBC they basically limited how high the roof assembly eave could be from the road surface where the fire department is able to pull up and that number is actually 55 feet we're, we're, we're basically concerned about the situation where we have a pedestal on the bottom where this type of building could have uh, something down below let's say mercantile or uh, parking level separate it now with a three-hour separation and then we can build an fpa 13r on top of it so you could start to see how this is a bit problematic especially if things get a little bit too high and out of hand we're concerned about when the fire department pulls up that the attic doesn't begin 55 feet above where the road surface is at that the fire truck rolls up so in this instance if it's greater than 55 feet we got to look at trying to protect this attic in some way
If NFPA 13R, after the summit, was deemed to be fine based upon the objective of life safety, and the IBC, you decided to make that change with podium construction, naturally, we need to slightly modify NFPA 13R. Uh, and, and we get this section here known as other attics. And it's trying to define what we do in attic spaces that are required now by the IBC. And we see here protection number one option is complying with NFPA 13. Uh, this is all the stuff that we just discussed and, and all of its drawbacks. And if we also look at it, it's, it's, it's a lot more sprinkler in that attic than what we're used to doing with the life safety aspect of NFPA 13R. What's interesting is that we get this second provision down here about protection using sprinklers specifically listed to provide attic protection in residential occupancies using a discharge density of not less than 0.05 and a design area of not less than four sprinklers. Uh, that number two criteria, that's just something that doesn't exist today. Uh, no manufacturer out there has this type of product. But it's interesting that NFPA 13 puts that out there because they realize NFPA 13R uh, doesn't need NFPA 13 level of protection in the attic. And now we're, we're, we're out opening this up and saying, hey, if, if you can go to a laboratory and prove out a product that can provide a level of protection using this low of a density and this low, low amount of sprinklers, then bring it to market. So very interesting stuff, something to watch for maybe in the future. We just detailed changes to the IBC 2018 edition that are going to require some changes in the way we apply NFPA 13 when we're dealing with that podium and pedestal style construction. But we need to be aware that IBC 2021 edition, although this book has not been published at the time of recording, the code cycle is now complete and it does change the threshold for residential occupancies and how we apply NFPA 13R. Now we're going to be taking a look at just where the fire truck pulls up and essentially make sure that the difference in height from the road access to that highest or lowest story is 30 foot or less. This is in line with the way that we apply requiring stand pipes towards these types of structures. And that's what we're going to need to do as well for determining uh, if we can use NFPA 13 R at all. Now, we just covered all the ways we can use standard spray sprinkler heads uh, according to the NFPA 13 standards. So now let's talk about why we would want to use attic sprinklers. Um, they're going to offer us better fire protection because we're going to locate those sprinklers as much as possible in the area where the heat collects. We design those sprinklers to deliver water in as many cases as possible to where the fire could be, some of the worst possible locations that fire could be in their coverage area. Uh, ultimately, these types of sprinkler heads lead to fewer branch lines and fewer sprinklers. The big goal of this type of product line is the ability to use CPVC pipe to supply those attic sprinklers and to supply those sprinklers uh, in the floor below should you choose to. We can give smaller dry system volumes as well. Um, and then every single one of these sprinkler heads has been validated by full scale fire testing at a approvals laboratory. An attic sprinkler is according to NFPA 13 going to be a special sprinkler. In 2016 edition and prior, we have a section in chapter eight that is known as special sprinklers. And it defines the characteristics that that product needs to offer uh, before we can bring it to market. And we take a look at, you know, number one, fire tests related to the intended hazard. Simple, we're gonna build an attic in a laboratory. We're gonna put our sprinklers in there. We're going to then do a fire test and see how they you know, react to that intended hazard. Number two, distribution of spray pattern with respect to wetting the floors and walls. We are going to do some spray distribution tests, make sure that everything gets wetted in that attic accordingly distribution of spray pattern with respect to obstructions. This here is a pretty big one for us because when we think about attic spaces and those pre-engineered trusses, we have crisscrossing web members. Uh, we need to make sure that that's all taken into account in that laboratory. And that's why we can make that statement that we don't need to count those as obstructions if you install our sprinklers the way that they're intended to be. The evaluation of thermal sensitivity of the sprinkler, number four, 
we know that we have to use quick response sprinklers when it comes to addicts uh, using standard spray. So our sprinklers got to perform accordingly uh, in the same quick response type category as those sprinklers. So we use fast response fusible operating elements to help achieve that. Number five, performance under horizontal slope ceilings. Well, we're not going to do any testing for an attic under horizontal ceiling. All of our attics are going to incorporate slope ceilings, and, and we're going to document and catalog the performance under that type of ceiling. Number six is our area of design. Well, we're going to do all that testing, and we're going to tell you exactly how to design that product in our technical literature. And then number seven, we have our cloud clearance to ceilings. Pretty simple. Where do we install that sprinkler with respect to that underside of the roof deck or let's say a top cord of a truss? UL's test program for these types of sprinklers is known as UL199G. And importantly, 199G is not considered a standard. If it was a standard, that would ultimately mean that there's only one way to really develop this type of product. Because it's actually an outline, it gives flexibility and freedom to the manufacturers to go in there and try and develop something different than what has come before. Now, some interesting things that are in that document. Uh, basically, in order for us to pass, the number of sprinklers operated shall not exceed the number required to be included in the sprinkler system hydraulic calculations. That's sort of an easy thing. We're going to do a test, and then we're going to define how you calculate it. We're not going to pick that number arbitrarily beforehand and then run a test. Um, number two, sprinklers installed at the peak near the end of the test room shall not operate. This is a pretty good um, thing to have in this test program because if we end up building our attic space and we install these sprinklers at the peak, we're going to light a fire in the middle of the attic. And essentially, we're going to make sure the sprinklers at the end of the test room do not operate. Uh, in doing this type of test this way, we prove that the fire will not run to the end of the attic and continuously run. It's going to stay contained within that small area of the attic section that is similarly designed to our test room. This also allows us not to have to worry about segregating our attic space, um, putting any kind of draft stops up or anything like that. And then lastly, one of the most interesting parts of this test is that you can't have a roof deck breach caused by fire that exceeds six square feet. Now, if we think about this, we, we run our test, and ultimately, um, after the test is done, UL inspects the damage to the roof, and if the hole is larger than six square foot, we're going to fail that test. Um, what is unknown to a lot of people is that if we end up protecting attics using standard spray sprinkler heads, uh, there's no guarantee about how big of a damage can occur to that roof deck. And when you look at some of the reports, we've seen numbers that are greater than six square foot. So the attic sprinkler programs that are run and the, the limitation of damage is very good for the building and property owner. For comparison's sake, let's bring back that same attic that we've shown you before utilizing standard spray sprinklers and now we can see the true benefit to attic sprinkler. Using a, a dual direction style, we place a single line at the peak, and now when that fire occurs down at the eave and that smoke goes up to the top, we're gonna get quick activation like before, but now the water delivery down to the eaves. This is going to offer a level of protection that's greater than what was offered by the standard sprays before because when that first head activated, you're not gonna discharge water right away on that fire, allowing it to grow and continue to cause damage in that attic until sprinklers much closer to it uh, would actually go off. Let's take a look at a test video of our dual direction attic sprinkler product. We're going to ignite a fire at the eave in our test crib. It's a pan of heptane with some wood on top of it. Uh, and you will see right away, bring it that fire, begin to directly impinge upon the underside of the attic. Now we can start to realize the criticality of the six square foot burn through number that we talked about. We're going to fast forward here at 10 times the speed and you're going to get to see the fire grow. We're not going to cut the video at all, uh, but you see some nice channeling of the fire up the underside of the slope and the framing members are actually keeping it 
pretty tight and not growing too far laterally. Here we go back to real time and we can see that the fire is not all that big. It's, it's still fairly reasonable and manageable. Um, but we're going to come up on our sprinkler activation here in just a second. And there we go. We just had our first sprinkler head operate. You'll notice that we have no water being discharged at this point. And that's because you're witnessing a test program for a dry sprinkler. The way this is run is that there's going to be a delay of water for 60 seconds. And that 60 second delay is actually indicated by the pie chart down at the bottom there. It's filling up. Um, what's really nice to notice about this video is that this is running at real time. The last minute of this fire, you can see right now how intense it is getting, how much bigger it is getting. It is just amazing when we think about how much this fire can grow exponentially in this last minute. And we have to realize that this whole time, reliable engineers are down there wondering when's the water going to come because we have six square foot of burn that we got to be aware of. And uh, we can see there the turbulence created by the fire almost knocks our GoPro down, but we're, we're finally going to get our water discharge in there. And that water discharge is occurring and it's very effective at knocking the fire down. So it's going to continue to discharge water at this point. If the fire goes out, then we'll stop the test. If the fire continues to burn, like you see it there on the screen, just down at the eave, we're going to continue to flow water for 30 minutes before we finally extinguish it and then begin our count of the, the, the square foot of burn through on the attic's roof. So after all that, what are we trying to get for the sprinkler contracting community? We want to give you a sprinkler that has unique and favorable hydraulic design requirements, one that can be utilized with CPVC when it's on a wet system, one that uh, is not going to require design area increase for the slope. Uh, it's because we're testing under a slope, so there's no reason to be penalized for the slope. And then ultimately, it's important to realize that the installation requirements are going to be particular to each manufacturer. Here's just an example of that same type of attic, simple gable attic. We have five branch lines in here that have 75 sprinklers in total. Our water demand for this type of attic is 326 gallons per minute. And if we look at the same situation with an attic sprinkler, we can do a single line down the middle, cut that to one branch line, keep it at 20 sprinkler heads. And then also we get a reduction in the amount of water that's required because on that dry system, we need seven of those heads, each one flowing 38 gallons a minute, 266 gallons per minute in total. The most important thing to take away from the opportunity to use attic sprinklers is that all attic sprinklers are not created equal. The UL199G outline allows every manufacturer to add their own wrinkle, their own way of making the product more suitable for your system. And that ultimately means that we have to really look at this stuff from the get go to make sure that we're applying a particular manufacturer's listed product for that system. This concludes our presentation of attic sprinkler technology. Uh, if you have some additional questions, feel free to reach out to the Technical Services Department at Reliable. We, have, uh, we are available by phone and email Monday through Friday, uh, 8.30 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you.